Isn't the shack, book, and film all about God's love? What if you learned it is really about universalism and the fact that everyone eventually goes to heaven? We hope you'll stay tuned to hear more. I use the shack as a metaphor. It's the inside house of the soul. It's the broken heart. And I have emails from people whose lives have been transformed. Others who have some theological beefs with quotes and page numbers from the shack. Within Christianity, there are few words that cut to the quick as sharply as heresy. And the shack has certainly been charged with his share of heresies. This is Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell. Eric Barger joins Jan today to discuss with James DeYoung the book and film The Shack. Dr. DeYoung has published a book under the title Burning Down the Shack, How the Christian Bestseller is Deceiving Millions. DeYoung's publication evaluates the theology and deceit found in the shack. Vital information critical for today's world. Now let's join the conversation with Jan Markell. How many of you have read this book, The Shack? How amazing. This book is extraordinary. It was originally written, William Paul Young's wife asked him to write a book for their six children to explain a little bit about what had happened in his life. She expected it to be between four and six pages long. He produced this in a ring folder, 15 copies for family and friends. Family and friends thought, I want my friends to see this. And so they started photocopying it. Eventually, in 13 months, they sold from a garage over a million copies. <clears throat> 26 publishers had turned it down. When he sold a million copies, they said, oh, maybe we'll publish it after all. <laughs> since then, it has been, and this has never happened before or since, for 49 consecutive weeks, it was the number one bestseller in the New York Times bestseller list. It's gone on to sell 20 million copies. It's about to be made into a feature film. The trailer is out. And welcome to the program. I'm so glad you could join me, and you've probably figured out that is our topic for the hour. We're going to be dealing with uh, inconvenient truths this hour. Some of you will not uh, want to hear this information. Uh, many of you will disagree. This ministry has always taken the position that the popular book and now the film The Shack is not biblically sound. Now that the movie has been out for a while, we are sounding an alarm that this is a spiritually dangerous production. This is Christian Fiction by William P. Young. And uh, due to the intense story, most readers get their emotions caught up in the story and are then blinded to the theological errors. The Shack presents an unbiblical picture of God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, and salvation. It promotes universalism, that all mankind will eventually be saved by a loving God. Now, we could stop there and just close the program, but we will try to explain the issues a little more deeply. Let me just say that it is a story of Mac, a man who has suffered a terrible tragedy, the murder of his young daughter, and whose faith has been left in tatters. But then he receives an unexpected invitation to return to the scene where that tragedy unfolded. And in that shack, he encounters Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, each in human form. Papa, an African-American woman as God, the Son, a middle-aged Middle Eastern man, and the Holy Spirit, an Asian woman. Together, over the course of a weekend, they deconstruct and then reconstruct Mac's faith and he leaves the shack a transformed man. We're going to discuss that for the next hour. I have on the line today my co-host Eric Barger is also a guest as he has a product about this. We'll say more in a moment. And I also have on the line from the West Coast Dr. James B. D. Young, author of the book Burning Down the Shack. We'll say more about that in just a moment. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Well, thank you, Jan. I'm glad to be with you today. Thank you. Just a few bullet points here. I mean, the secret of its success. The author gives a, a Christian explanation for why people suffer. It deals with severe suffering. Look, Mac loses a daughter. If God is a good God, why do people suffer so? 
These are some of the questions this book and film are addressing. Many are angry at God, or at the very least, they don't understand him. So gentlemen, these are issues everyone struggles with. Is this why this is so popular, this film and book? Well, I think so. These are universal questions on the part of both Christians and non-Christians alike. And I think uh, the shack seeks to give at least one answer to this and does so in a very creative and attractive way. Uh, it's my belief that when it deals with the human emotions and we begin to base our belief system on our emotions, then we really have done what Second Timothy chapter 4 mm -hmm. talks about, which is we're surrounding ourselves with teaching and teachers to tell us what we want to hear instead of what the scripture says. Mm -hmm. I have have no um, ill against Paul Young, uh, but when you talk about theologies and you talk about belief systems, this book does deconstruct with a fantasy uh, the whole Bible when you get down to it, the, really the crux of the Bible, and the Bible never gives us the right to say, oh, it's just a fantasy, I'm going to accept what it says, or I'm going to read what it says and take it as entertainment. We're to test fantasy the same as anything that comes mm -hmm. along in reality. Okay, but another theme in the book and film is if God is love, why does he say send people to hell. The production is going to deny the existence of hell. Would that be correct, that God would save everyone in the end? Well, yes, and that I think is affirmed in, in a roundabout way. The tone of the book and some of the explicit statements, and I think these will be seen on screen as well, is that God did not punish sin. God is not a God of judgment. He's a God of forgiveness, of reconciliation, that all people are counted as his children. And in that way, uh, among others, there is a denial of uh, everlasting judgment, a place where people go who choose to reject Christ and uh, who suffer the consequences of that choice. You say, Dr. DeYoung, that in 2004, William Paul Young, author of The Shack, embraced universal reconciliation or universalism. In other words, everyone will be saved. You found that out in a face-to-face -face meeting with him, correct? Well, yes, and it was more than just a face-to-face -face meeting in the sense that uh, Paul and I had co-founded a forum that had begun meeting a few years before then. Paul presented his paper titled uh, Universal Reconciliation, and in that paper he said, among many other things, I am rejecting my evangelical paradigm. I am embracing universal reconciliation. And uh, I was taken aback by that, as I think most of us were. But uh, he went on to talk about this and, and summarized his 103-page paper. And uh, it was quite a shock to us because it was a turnaround from what I knew Paul to be up until that time. I went to Portland in October 2008, and I heard uh, Paul Young speak. And this, by the way, was at the, the height of the book's popularity when it first came out. I heard him speak three times in two days at his alma mater, which is uh, Warner Pacific University in Portland. And uh, in the second, uh, right before the second meeting, it was a noon meeting or so, I was in the room before anyone else was there. He came in. I was able to approach him. We had a discussion. I asked him several questions. One question I asked him, was, are you a universalist? And I look back now and realize I wish I'd have met Dr. D. Young before I'd asked that question because I would ask it differently. A month later, I sat at uh, Dr. D. Young's kitchen table and we discussed all this. And one evening, like about four hours, I was there, I guess, and had a great discussion, built a friendship. But I asked Paul Young if he was a universalist. He said, no, absolutely not, was his actual answer. And I look back now and realize I should ask him, are you now or have you ever been a reconciling universalist? Because okay. I guess in his mind, he could parse it just enough to make that statement to me to tell me he was not a universalist, but reconciling universalism is something that's especially of Dr. DeYoung's and um, something I've done a DVD on. This is a very serious issue. I'd like to play my first clip of Dr. Michael Youssef, who lays out his problem with the production of The Shack. I want to warn you especially of books and teachings that are almost right, but devastatingly wrong. Teachings and preachings and books that have a measure of truth in them, but they're wrapped in a whole lot of poisonous dough. Uh, hear me right on this one, because this is really important. And I know most of you would agree with me. That half-truths, almost right, outwardly appealing, are far more dangerous than plain wrong and evil. Let me illustrate this. If you're walking along the way and you see a ditch, you're going to avoid it. It's clear. It's in front of you. It's marked. You're going to walk around it, and therefore you're not going to fall in it. But if that ditch is covered with beautiful landscape and beautiful flowers, and if you're walking and not watching, chances are you might fall in that ditch. And that's precisely what this popular novel, The Shack, 
is all about. It's a deep ditch that is covered with beautiful landscape. And sadly, to my heartbreak, and please listen, I do not make this statement in any form of exaggeration. I lost a lot of sleep over this. To my heartbreak, many Christians are falling in that ditch. Many churches are studying in their Sunday school classes. Uh, Many schools are handing it out to their students. Many pastors are singing its praises. Christians are giving it away by the caseful to their friends with statements like, it changed my life. Read this book. A minister said it was better than three years in seminary. All I can say is he went to a very sorry seminary. But beloved, it is of vital importance for me to deal with this book. And in doing so, I know, listen carefully, I know that I am risking the anger and the ire of some of you who like this book. But I pray that God the Holy Spirit will open your eyes and give you discernment and open your heart that you would hear the truth as it is from the Word of God, not from Michael Yusuf. Some have said to me, to my heart break again, this book is better than the Bible. Eric, he's risking his ministry in a sense, and then I guess we are too as well, and I think we need to clarify that we are not trying to come across as judgmental, that we're just trying to sound a warning here. Exactly. Folks, if you've read the book and somehow you liked it, we're not trying to say that you were in the Stone Ages, you're a Neanderthal, that you you don't know what you're doing. That's, that's not it at all. I believe that discernment is something that we need to uh, be taught to some extent. We also need to be open to it. And discernment today is at an all-time low of here inside the Christian church, especially when a book like The Shack is uh, the number one spot in the bestseller list both in the secular world and in Christianity. But if the effect of the book was uh, dramatic upon people's lives back a few years ago when it first came out, uh, the movie is going to be uh, with an exclamation point. It's going to be more dramatic because with surround sound and a huge screen and good acting Mm -hmm. and great cinematography, Paul Young's theology is being told through this book. And uh, that cannot be overstated. He is teaching his own brand of theology and some of the theology in it is deadly. Some of it is just bad theology, but the idea of universal reconciliation the idea of how to be saved, the idea of who is saved, or whether there is retribution, whether there is hell, those things are all at play here. This is a serious topic, and one that every one of us should understand. And I, may I say that everybody listening, if you're a Christian and you say, yes, I see problems in the shack, you have a wonderful opportunity right now because uh, the Christian world is a fire, on fire and a buzz with information about the shack. This is a great time for you to step forward and be able to, in one-on-one conversation, in coffee shops or homes or wherever you might be at church, be able to talk about this if you have the understanding and the information. Let me give some uh, contact information here. You can visit uh, Dr. D. Young's website, which is burningdowntheshackbook.com, burningdowntheshackbook.com. A lot of this information is there, but you can only get the book at WorldNetDaily or WND.com, WND.com. So uh, you don't need to call us, folks, because we're not carrying any of these products. And you can find Eric Barger's outstanding DVD on the topic. It's uh, titled The Death of Discernment. And that looks at the shack carefully. Find that at ericbarger.com, ericbarger.com. Again, Olive Tree is not carrying these products. So you need to order at these online locations only. Dr. DeYoung, the Bible says no one can look at God. In the Bible, various people tried to look at God or they were in his presence and and there were actual consequences. Yet in the Shack book and film, God is an African-American woman, and that alone should be troubling, but even more troubling the fact that we are looking at her or him and talking to her or him is extremely troubling. Well, I agree. I recently uploaded to my website a paper dealing with the the question of idolatry uh, in the film. I think it is one thing to uh, write about the Trinity, as Paul did in The Shack, but the sensitivity to the scriptural mandate about not making any idol and worshiping it on the second commandment is raised to another height or becomes far more uh, serious once you visualize in a concrete form, as the film does, the Trinity. You know, we have caricatures, we have paintings of uh, God the Father, I'm thinking of Michelangelo, we have paintings in our homes about Jesus, Mm -hmm. we have uh, icons, we have crucifixes and so forth, and those all concern the second person of the Trinity. But once you go beyond that and try to depict 
and portray the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, as three separate beings, you have gone over the line. A person is going far beyond a simple understanding of who Jesus is to now trying to depict the entire Trinity. And then to put this on screen is a further step of critical awareness, and I think raises the whole issue of idolatry to a far more serious extent. And also this Papa, this African-American woman who plays God, says those who love me include Buddhists, Mormons, Muslims, and more. And she says, or he says, I have no desire to make them Christians. And that is troubling as well. This statement is in line with other universalists who say they don't want to be identified as Christian. They think that's a bad word. It tends to alienate people who are non-Christians and so forth. And so they want to be known as followers of Jesus, but not as Christians. But when you take Paul's word that you just quoted, uh, the implication is that uh, there are people from all walks of life and various religions who seemingly are enthralled with Jesus, but there's never a statement to the effect that, well, these people need to repent, believe the gospel, and accept Christ. They need to acknowledge him as both Savior and Lord, believe that he died and rose again for our sins, and so forth. So the leave it just as it is stated, is in line with other universalist thinking. The good news to them is bad news, as we evangelicals proclaim it, yes. because we emphasize the need to be saved from sin and well, from judgment. And so they want to recreate the terminology, they want to refocus the church, if it is uh, legitimate to even think about a church, and they want to focus our attention on a different understanding of who God is, which is the primary problem. Young himself calls the God of evangelical Christianity a monster. Perhaps we can take a look at that here in our next segment. I need to take a quick time out. We're coming back in just a couple of minutes, talking to Dr. James D. Young, uh, author of the book Burning Down the Shack, and also Eric Barger about his DVD, The Death of Discernment. Both look carefully at the latest phenomenon, book and film, The Shack. We're going to pick this up in just a minute or two. Don't go away. As you've been hearing, The Shack, the book and the film, have some serious problems with theology. Coming up, Jan and Eric will unpack more from Dr. James DeYoung. You can get DeYoung's book about the shack from World Net Daily or WND.com. And you can download articles written by James DeYoung when you visit burningdowntheshackbook.com. In his video, Death of Discernment, Eric Barger discusses how the shack became the number one bestseller in Christianity. You can find that video at ericbarger.com. You can order your own audio CD copy of today's edition of Understanding the Times when you phone 763-559-4444. Or you can download it from our complete archives in our radio tab at olivetreeviews.org. You can support this ministry when you donate online at olivetreeviews.org or when you write to Olive Tree Ministries, Post Office Box 1452. Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. We'll return to today's discussion right after this reminder about our October 7th Understanding the Times conference. It's not too early to make plans to attend Understanding the Times 2017, Saturday, October 7th, just outside of Minneapolis. Join us at Grace Church in Eden Prairie from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. There's no cost or registration needed. You can spend the day with like-minded believers who don't think it's strange that you want to understand the times and also discern the times of Bible prophecy. Speakers include Amir Sarfati. Our book, the Bible, contains 29% future events. 29% of this book is Bible prophecy. God wants us to know even the future. Dr. Mark Hitchcock. So I I don't believe in we should scoff at signs. I don't believe we should be reckless speculators, but I do believe uh, that signs of the times are important and that we live in a time today when the stage is being set. Pastor J.D. Farag from Calvary Chapel, Kaneohe, Hawaii. Jerusalem, as Joel Rosenberg calls it, is the epicenter. It is the, the second hand on God's prophetic clock. You want to know what time it is in terms of Bible prophecy? Look at Jerusalem. Michelle Bachman. Jesus Christ is coming back. We, in our lifetimes, potentially could see Jesus Christ returning to earth, the rapture of the church. This is one of the most exciting times in history. We need to be exactly watching the tenor of the times, be observing, and look up our redemption draw off night. 
Hotel information is posted at our website, olivetreeviews.org, or call us for complete details at 763-559-4444. That's 763-559-4444. We have promised that we'll keep talking about today, but always with an eye on tomorrow and the hope of His return. In today's world, who do you trust for good insight on current events? For that matter, who do you trust for good Bible commentary? America is full of fake news and false teaching. That's why we want to offer you an alternative to both. We are Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell, and our main objective is to tell you the truth about current events as they relate to a biblical worldview. Join us each week on this station for a source you can trust. So you weren't setting out to write a theological treatise on the nature of God. You were writing about something deeper. Yeah. Well, I don't know if there's much deeper than a theological treatise. <laughs> but uh, my intent was, was not to be trying to say, okay, this is Theology 101, systematic theology. It's, it's not that. And, uh, um, but the book is highly theological. There's, but life is theological. If God is involved in all the details of our lives, then life is theological. On today's Understanding the Times Radio, Jan Markell and Eric Barger are meeting with James DeYoung to discuss the book and film, The Shack. Eric has also been involved in investigating the theological issues surrounding this controversial book and motion picture. Let's return to the conversation. And welcome back. And again, this weekend we're looking at the phenomenon, and I'm using that word intentionally because that is what The Shack has become, both a book and now film. Many of you listening have now seen the film, or you will. And again, we're not trying to uh, be judgmental this particular hour. As a watchman, we do need to sound the warning. And the warning is that this is not a sound story. We're trying to explain why throughout the hour. I have in front of me a book. You can only get it at WorldNet Daily or WND.com. Burning Down the Shack, How the Christian Bestseller is Deceiving Millions. That bestseller being the shack. And I have read it. Again, you can only get it at WND.com. Don't call here. Please check the uh, website out for that information. And we're just trying to arm you so that as you or many of your friends, family members, co-workers come running and telling you this is the most phenomenal story they have ever read or viewed in their entire life. We're trying to present perhaps the other side of the story, the truth. And Eric, there's an idolatry factor here. And the Holy Spirit, who is played by, um, I believe, a woman, correct? Her name That's is correct. Suryu, based after a Polynesian goddess? Well, in Romans chapter 1, I asked Paul Young about this in my confrontation with him back in 2008 at Warner Pacific College and uh, asked him, what do you do with the idea of idol worship? You've made God the Father into an image here. What do you do with this? And he says, he said to me, exact quote, do you suppose anybody is going to worship her, the Papa character? And I said back to him, I said, well, there are some people who already do worship a character like that. And then I ask him, are you aware of a Polynesian Hawaiian cultic goddess or goddess figure in their religions that resembles your Papa character who's also called Papa? And he told me he was not aware of it. And I said, you know, I would have gone to the internet and just done a simple search and uh, put in a few things that would lead me to see if there was any other characters out there that, that were like mine. When you read about this Polynesian goddess and what is said about her, it is the same thing that he is presenting in a Christian fashion. And his parents were, were missionaries in New Guinea, and I'll just let listeners figure out what they think about all that, but I think there is something to this. And I asked him, do you know about it? He said no, but we have this goddess figure in Polynesian cultic religion that just doesn't look kind of like. It it is okay. exactly like his Papa character in the book, The Shack. Dr. James DeYoung, again, in the theology of 
universal reconciliation or universalism. Correct me if I'm wrong here, please. Even the devil and his angels will be corrected and purified eventually. I mean, they will repent and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and enter into heaven. In the end, hell will cease to exist. God's love triumphs over all. Is this a thread through the shack? Well, I believe it is, Jan. It's uh, subtle, but by collecting the various statements together that represent a broader position of uh, universal reconciliation, they add up to that effect. When in this shack, Paul Young has God say that I don't punish sin, sin is its own punishment. In another context, he'll talk about there's not an eternal judgment or everlasting uh, judgment awaiting people. In his original commitment to universal reconciliation, Paul went much further and denounced any such view that there is eternal judgment at all. And according to universalism, all people will be purified by the fires of hell, not judged, not uh, punished, but purified and chastised as it is, and they will repent, and eventually all of those in hell will go to heaven, including eventually Satan and his fallen angels. So the hell ceases to exist. And this is standard universalism fair, because they argue logically from reason that it's impossible for God's love to have failed somewhere in the universe. And of course, what they do in saying that is to reject the biblical witness that there is everlasting judgment waiting those who reject the person of Jesus Christ. So they let reason triumph over revelation. Mm -hmm. They are rejecting the authority of Scripture for what they think is reasonable, and yet their reasoning is even clouded and perverse. Because by following that reasoning, you eventually have to say, well, then the devil could rebel from heaven again and be cast out and then repent again. And on and on it goes. You have a cycle of repentance, judgment, repentance, and so forth. And that's impossible. But it is the natural outcome of such reasoning that departs from biblical truth. Well, I continue to be troubled because of the fact that in the Bible, it certainly says that no man can look at God. Some tried in the Bible. Dr. Michael Yusuf, he's got some excellent illustrations here. I want to play a two-minute clip of him. Isaiah was completely overwhelmed by God, said, woe is me when he saw God. And yet we have God being again portrayed as an African-American woman. Let me just play this real short clip by Dr. Michael Yousef. One of the most devastating aspects of this book, The Shack, is the absolute disrespect and disregard to the holy God by this main character. Beloved, when Isaiah saw a glimpse of God's glory, he was so overwhelmed, he was so overcome, and he cries out in chapter 6 saying, Woe to me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and dwell in the midst of people who are unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. In Exodus chapter 3, when Moses encountered God in the burning bush, he hid his face because he was afraid to look upon God's glory. In Exodus 33, Moses was given just a glimpse of God's glory because God told him that if you look upon my face, you'll die. And John the Revelator, which I mentioned in the last message, this is a disciple whom Jesus loved, who leaned upon Jesus' shoulder when he was taken up to heaven and was given a revelation of the reigning, ruling, victorious Christ. He was so overwhelmed. He was so overcome because he saw the indwellings of heaven, the dwellers of heaven, the inhabitants of heaven crying, holy, 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 glory, glory, glory that he fell on his face. And yet we see a man who puts God on trial and uses foul language in the presence of so-called God the Father. And then he snaps at God with anger, so much so that he makes God cry. Beloved, this is not someone who is in the presence of the holy God of heaven and earth. He is in the presence of a God who is created in man's own image. A God who obeys man. A God who exists in man's figment of imagination. A God who exists in man's needs and des- for, for man's needs and desires. A God who is controlled and manipulated by man. A God is like an idol or like a Hindu idol where they open the closet and get the idol out and have some talking to and then put that idol back and close the closet. This is not the holy and righteous creator God of the Bible. This is not the powerful God who said, let there be light and there was light. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Markell. I have on the line uh, Dr. James B. DeYoung, and I'm also 
making references to his book, Burning Down the Shack, How the Christian Bestseller is Deceiving Millions at WND.com. Only place to get it. Have to get it online. I also have online my co-host. Today is sort of a co-guest because Eric Barger, I consider to also to be an expert on this particular topic. You can find his DVD, The Death of Discernment, which is about the shack at ericbarger.com. Eric, I want to revisit something real briefly. And we touched on it a few minutes ago, but that it would be the fact that, um, look, this is fantasy fiction. Uh, Get over it, uh, Jan and crew. Can't we just enjoy a little bit of fantasy fiction now and then and set aside the seriousness? I've heard that argument so often, Jan. I've heard it about the Harry Potter series when people want to defend it. And how many people would say, well, I'm a Christian, but, and then they begin to defend something that's uh, obviously unbiblical. And the more you look at it, you wonder, how do people get to that conclusion? But uh, as I said early on, and I kind of briefly mentioned this, there's nowhere the scripture gives us the levity to judge fantasy any different than something that's reality, something that's in real life. And uh, this is a fantasy story. It's a Christian in fiction, but it is packaging the theology of Paul Young, which is that uh, God is neither he or she, and by the way, try to say that or tell that to any Jewish rabbi. Any Orthodox rabbi would tell you God is male and he's presented himself that way. Now, that's not chauvinism, folks. That's just the truth. And also the idea of how to be saved and who is saved. And those are the questions that uh, Dr. DeYoung has uh, covered in his papers on reconciling universalism, and he has a forthcoming book that'll be on that as well. But I really encourage folks to get the papers from Dr. DeYoung's site from his his website and read them and use them as witnessing tools to talk to others because we judge reality and fantasy the same way. We put them all to the same test and we've got to have that mindset and not be drawn in just a great cinematography and the surround sound and the big screen and all that that we've already mentioned. And that is true. And Dr. DeYoung, that is what is so concerning is that the visual impact of this film is going to be far more, well, let's just say compelling than the book, correct? Well, yes, and that's true of any film, yes. uh, any story that we see put on film. Uh, I, I would agree with what Michael Youssef had emphasized, and that is he was really going to the heart of the Second Commandment. The reason there's a prohibition of idol-making is that uh, it detracts from the true essence of God, and the glory of God cannot be packaged into any created element on the face of this planet. As soon as you think of trying to represent the Trinity, God the Father and the Spirit, especially in some concrete form, you are violating and detracting from who God truly is. He cannot be uh, packaged that way. He's above his creation in every respect. And so it is just a terribly evil consequence that we should come to this place in Christian fiction writing and cinematography that this should happen. But it's nothing new, because uh, in early colonial America, universalists used fiction to propagate their story, and they were widely successful for a time. One thing that, that I feel really torn about, people in Christian radio are being presented with ads for the, for the movie The Shack, and have been now for weeks. And, and what does the, the Christian radio manager say about those ads. What about the Christian bookstores? I have a personal mm. friend who uh, owns a bookstore in the Midwest, and uh, I walked in when, when the Shack book was at its popularity, the peak of popularity. And I asked him if he knew what was in the book, and I told him two or three things, and happened to come back in his store the next day. And he took me back to the back of the, the store, back to the alley, right at the doorway, and he said, there is the display that was out front yesterday. I obviously saw the display was gone when I walked in, and he said, it's going back to them. He just needed the information and understanding of what the book was all about. He'd not read it. And not everybody in Mm -hmm. every Christian bookstore, not everybody who works there, every manager, every owner is going to read every book on their shelves. And this is a great example of of just the conundrum that now this is placing before us. And just don't think, folks, because somebody is advertising the Shack book that they're putting their stamp of approval on it. That may not be the case if you know all the backstory. And I I just want to give a a little bit of uh, breathing room to the the radio manager and the, uh, the bookstore. Okay, thank you, Eric. Dr. DeYoung, I want to read something. I believe it's off of your website, which again is burningdowntheshackbook.com. Let me read just a paragraph and get your response. It says, uh, perhaps the most slanderous thing that Young says comes when he addresses Jesus Christ and torture. Reflect on the meaning of what Paul Young is saying. 
Now here's what Paul Young is saying. Except Satan himself, Pharaoh, Nero, and Hitler were among the most horrible killers of men this world has ever known. Yet the doctrine of eternal torture makes Jesus a million times more vicious and vindictive than these three put together. You see, these brutal murderers killed their victims. Death brought sweet relief in a moment of time. However, that man of Galilee, that man whom we love, praise, and worship, that man who taught that we should forgive 490 times a day, that man who told us that we should love our enemies and bless them that curse us, That man who died for all men will never forgive anyone who has rejected him in this frail life, or worse yet, who merely failed to believe on him during this brief time, instead of torturing them for a season and then ending their suffering with death as a Hitler or Nero, Jesus will oversee their torture through all eternity, and we are supposed to be happy about this. You are commenting on this long paragraph. I just read, which is Paul Young commenting about Jesus, torture, eternity, hell, etc. You know, uh, Jan, you were quoting me, and I was quoting Paul Young in yes. his paper from 2004. Yes. In summary, I'd say this is universalism on mask. This is what it is really like when you would ask them, what do you think of evangelical teaching? What do you think of the Bible when it talks about these great truths such as we've been talking about? And universalism ends up blaspheming and uh, uh, cursing, really, the truth as revealed in Scripture and as Jesus spoke it. If you were to ask Paul Young, what do you think of this? He would say, well, don't quote me on it. Don't align me with that thought today. I'm a person in process. I had that discussion with him Mm -hmm. a couple years after he wrote that, and I tried to figure out, well, where are you, Paul? and he refused to commit himself. Well, you know, the rest of us as Christians who want to follow Jesus would say, I follow Jesus, I believe everything that he communicated in the Bible as an act of obedience, I commit myself to love and to follow him, and he was unwilling to do that. So the only thing I can conclude is that he is waffling in regards to the truth. He doesn't want to come across that strongly in any of his writings, and certainly not in the film, but this is the heart of universalism. This is what it ends up actually affirming and and asserting, and it's very, very troubling. And no Christian, frankly, could ever identify with such thoughts unless he was deeply deceived, thinking he had found somehow a better way under the deceit of the devil. And I frankly think that that's what has happened. Yes, I would agree with you. Eric, uh, you want to comment that we're down to Um, a minute here? On the other side of that, Paul has made statements he doesn't believe in the substitutionary atonement of Christ. So you've got all these issues playing together that are building his theological points. Well, you know, I want to go back to where I opened with, because your average reader, your average film goer is identifying with, oh, things like, God doesn't really care about me, he's abandoned me, and this comes out in the film and the book. If God is a good God, why do people suffer so? People are coming, and it's their emotions that are getting ministered to in this book and this film, and these are legitimate emotions. Well, I agree that that is the very subtle approach, uh, the very powerful approach that this book and the film will make. Everybody longs for having a deeper relationship with God, especially we who confess Christ. And the book satisfied that to a certain extent and on a certain level. But everybody needs to back up and say, well, now, if I'm pursuing a deeper relationship with God, who is the God with whom I am having this relationship? And when we look at the total teaching of universalism, it is not the God of the Bible. And so the conclusion is this. If I'm having a deeper relationship with God who is not the God of the Bible, then I'm not having a deeper relationship with God. It is something else. Okay. Something else has come in play, into play and taken the place of that. We're going to come back in just a couple of minutes, and we'll wrap up our hour trying to unwrap and unpackage both the book and the film, The Shack, since the film has been out now a week or two, and the book has been out for a number of years now, and of course, I believe it's one of the top 40 selling books of all time. Back in just a couple of minutes minutes. Every weekend, Understanding the Times Radio brings you issues of concern to give you insight into the last days. Today's topic has been a controversial one since The Shack was first published 10 years ago. Following the release of the film version last weekend, today we're bringing you the truth about some of the issues surrounding it. Jen and Eric's guest, James DeYoung's book, Burning Down the Shack, can be found at WND.com. We'd like to stay in touch with you through our website at olivetreeviews.org. You'll find information on our next fall conference. 
And you can subscribe to our newsletters and e-news alerts. For support or other correspondence, please write to Olive Tree Ministries, Post Office Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. Reach us by phone at 763-559-4444. In just a moment, Jen and Eric will conclude today's broadcast. This program has tried to provide a voice for the remnant believers for almost 16 years. We began on one station in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, but quickly expanded as those who wanted the truth of our times were across the country. We can't thank you enough for being a part of our team with your giving and your prayer support. The Olive Tree family has grown beyond all our expectations. To keep this message alive in your neighborhood, would you consider a tax-deductible gift to Olive Tree Ministries in 2017? Just write Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. Or find our donate page online at olivetreeviews.org. You can always call us at 763-559-4444, 763-559-4444. Remember, we keep an eye on today's headlines, but we also look at what the Bible says about tomorrow and the hope of His return. This is Understanding the Times Radio, the fusion of current events and biblical insights. Every week we bring you the best voices who discern our times according to the Bible. Join us every weekend on this station for an experience with truth that will enlighten your day. Understanding the times in which we live keeps us prepared for the changes coming to our world. The Bible is clear that the last days will be full of deception, delusion, and corruption like the world has never known. Every week we deliver to you insights that discern our days and bring you hope. We are Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell. Who is right, the critics or the defenders of the book? Does the shack have a theology? Or are we reading too much into it? William Paul Young, the author of The Shack, stated that The Shack was never intended to be a systematic theology or another book of pragmatic proof texts useful for badgering unwitting unbelievers into religious submission. It is fiction and it is story. It seems to be clear that the book is fiction. But does this mean that there is no theology being taught? William Paul Young states, Please don't misunderstand me. The shack is theology, but it is a theology wrapped in a story. The word becoming flesh, living inside the blood and bones of common human experience. Next on Understanding the Times, the wrap-up of today's conversation on the shack. Once again, Jen and Eric with their guest, James DeYoung. The author of the shack not only presents a false view of God, He presents a different God, different from the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. But not only that, but he mocks the importance and the uniqueness of the Bible. He makes the Bible to be equal to whatever personal imagination of what God is like. Whatever you imagine God is like is equal to the Bible. Please listen carefully. Please listen carefully. God is spirit, and he does not have a body. Yet he chose to reveal himself in the masculine form. Nowhere does God reveal himself as a goddess. No wonder Oprah likes this book and promotes it. Listen to me, beloved friends. If we try to imagine what God is like, we will pay a hefty price. 
And I want to explain this to you because it's very important. The Bible is very clear. Dare not, dare not portray God in an image. It is impossible to make the Creator part of the creation. Jesus said in John chapter 4, verse 24, God is spirit, and he who worship him must worship him in truth and in spirit. The second commandment forbids us from making a visual portrayal of God. To worship such an image is pure idolatry. To worship an image of God is to worship the creation, not the creator. Portraying God the Father as an African-American woman or a white old man, I don't care which way it is. Portraying the Holy Spirit as an Asian woman or white man, it makes no difference to me no matter what it is, is purely sinful. And we will reap the judgment of God if we fall for these heresies. And you can hear the passion in the voice of Dr. Michael Youssef. And he knew he was, well, he was counting the cost as he gave that message a couple years ago, pleading with his church members to avoid, at that time, the book The Shack, which is now a film. Many of you have seen it. Many of you have recommended it. Let me ask just a couple of questions here. And by the way, I have on the line Eric Barger. You can find out more about his product on The Shack, The Death of Discernment DVD. Got to go to ericbarger.com. Only way you can get it, ericbarger.com. I'm also talking about the book, Burning Down the Shack, How the Christian Bestseller is Deceiving Millions, Dr. James B. D. Young, on the line with me from the West Coast, wnd.com, only place. Don't call us, folks. These are the places you've got to get them online, wnd.com. Gentlemen, we have some folks listening right now, maybe pastors, maybe just anybody listening right now. They've recommended to just about everybody they know. You've got to get acquainted with the, the book and the film. It changed my life. Well, what do you say to them? I think what the best thing we can do, if we come to the realization that anything we've endorsed personally is not of God, the right thing to do is go to those, if we can, who we've told those things to and promoted it to, and simply repent and tell them we were wrong and we've come to another conclusion and take the scriptures with us. Folks, the Bible says if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel, that we're to be accursed. There's only one gospel. There's not two or three or five or ten. Galatians 1 is clear. And Paul's making that very, very clear to us. There's only one gospel. The gospel presented by the shack is not the gospel presented in the Bible, period. Dr. DeYoung, your comments, please. Jan, I think the best way that I can help your listeners is to say something like this. Every Christian that goes to see the movie in the, in the theaters in the near future becomes a critic, a movie critic, or ought to be. And I've uploaded to my website, burningdowntheshackbook.com, some statements there, and I've isolated 21 statements that are in the book, and most of them will be repeated on the screen in the film. And I'm asking your listeners to see if these things indeed are said, because if they are, they are the seeds of universalism. They are the subtle attempt to use a film to project a theological message, as well as a caring, helpful kind of message, but ill-based. And these 21 statements are something that uh, every Christian ought to look for when they see the film so as to identify the uh, subtle attempt to uh, sell universalism to the viewer. They are called 21 statements, and they are found on my website in a paper. That's burningdowntheshackbook.com. Let me just read some of them. I have a few in front of me. I won't read them all, but... uh... Papa, depicting God the Father, says that the first aspect of his being is not that he is almighty, but that he limits himself. Another quote would be, the whole trinity was crucified. This is contained in the book and the film. Another concept here, God does not punish sin, but cures it. Another concept here, God will not condemn most to eternity of torment. Another one, mercy triumphs over justice because of love. Another concept, God is now fully reconciled to the world. Another concept, in Jesus I have forgiven all humans for their sins against me. Now that alone, Dr. DeYoung, in Jesus I have forgiven all all humans for their sins against me. That's all humans, whether they believe in Jesus or not, correct? Well, that's how it stands. 
we would affirm, of course, just the opposite, that uh, forgiveness comes to us only as we hear the gospel, the gospel of the death and resurrection of Christ, and believe. It calls for a response on the part of humans, of people. You know, somebody has remarked and observed that uh, universalism is very, very deterministic, because whether or not a person wills to believe or not, he will go to heaven in the end. And that is the denial of how God has created all human beings in his image and given them the choice to make, and God honors the choice. C.S. Lewis pointed out a long time ago that Jesus says to those who obey him, your will be done, but those who disobey him, he also says, your will be done. If you choose to disbelieve in me, then you will suffer the consequences of that. So uh, thank you for sharing those part of those uh, 21 statements. I think they are very crucial. The groundwork was set a long time ago. When you think about how much of the Church only believes that God is a God of love. Uh, That's what's been preached from pulpits in many of the mainline churches, and sadly now in many evangelical churches, that same thinking is being reproduced in people, that God's only a God of love. Folks, you do not have the God of the Bible unless you also have Mm -hmm. the God of justice at the same time. He is the God of love and the God of justice. If what is taught in the shack was a part of an actual physical group or church in the world today, it would be the work of every apologist I know and any pastor worth his salt to expose them for what they are, because where they lead people is to an eternity without the very God they claim to be serving. Right. I wanted to quote from blogger Tim Challies. He says, my foremost concern with the shack, the one that will keep me from seeing it or even for the purpose of review is its visual representation of God. To watch the shack is to watch human actors play the roles of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I take this to be a clear, serious violation of the second commandment. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Chalice goes on to say, I will not see this film even to review it because I will not and cannot watch humans pretend to be God. I will grant that the primary concern of the second commandment is worship. It forbids creating any image of God in order to worship God through that image, yet the commandment first forbids any visual representation for any reason. Folks, again, I'll give the products and how you get them one more time. The book is Burning Down the Shack, How the Christian Bestseller is Deceiving Millions, only at WND.com, WND.com. But you can check out Dr. James D. Young's website, BurningDownTheShackBook.com, BurningDownTheShackBook.com. And then Eric Barger's DVD, The Death of Discernment, EricBarger.com. Let's wrap this up, Eric. Let's say you're a Christian and you have seen nothing wrong with the shack, but you hear all this. I advise you to do what I tell people to do on any topic. Put what we've said to the test, the biblical test. You know, really the problem here, folks, is that the Bible is not in first place in our thinking anymore. And it's been demoted. A lot of what Paul Young believes is very popular in emergent circles. It really goes right along with Rob Bell and others. You begin to think about that. You've got to put the Bible up and say, that is my authority. That's the only place I know that I can trust everything in it. What it teaches from cover to cover is God's word to me. So test everything. And I think that's maybe one of the most important things. If you have recommended the book or bought it and given it away to friends, try to speak with them. Show them that maybe this wasn't the right way to go and that now you've thought about it you learned more you have better information and repent if need be if you've done this if you're a christian leader it's going to be hard for you to stand up and say i was wrong about this but it's the right thing to do and we've already talked about what if you're a bookstore owner and yeah. so on okay i just advise everybody get ready to talk to somebody about the chat dr james de young if you'd like to sum up well yes let me just steer people to some of the appendices in my book burning down the shack 
in Section 1, I raise questions that people may have for Mac in the story. And then in Chapter 2 of my appendix, I have answers to readers' questions. So we haven't covered all the people's questions that they have, but that appendix should answer several more that are in people's thinking. I want to thank you both for joining me today, and I want to thank you both for contending for the faith, which is what we are commanded to do in the Bible, folks. It's rather clear. The Bible talks about end-time apostasy, people wanting their ears tickled, giving heed to fables, and we have tried to paint a realistic picture today of a popular product and message, but one that is seriously off base and that is truly tickling ears. It's leading people astray. It's denying the reality of hell. Our plea is that you would reconsider the validity of the shack in all its forms. Again, learn more at burningdowntheshackbook.com and uh, ericbarger.com. I want to thank you for listening, and we will talk to you next week. are a moment, you are forever, Lord of the ages, God before time, we are a vapor, you are... Thank you for joining us for today's Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell. We continue to reach the world by reporting current events from a biblical perspective costing us thousands of dollars. This listener-supported program is delivered each weekend nationwide and into your home. You can help us produce and distribute this broadcast. We invite you to partner with this ministry. With our ever-changing world, men and women of faith need to be aware of current events as reported and discussed through the lens of Scripture. With a blessed hope in view, week after week, Jan Markell brings you compelling guest interviews to highlight the dangers in today's world. To become our broadcast partner, please write with your tax-deductible gifts to Olive Tree Ministries, Post Office Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. You can also help underwrite this program safely and securely at olivetreeviews.org or when you phone 763-559-4444. We're looking forward to hearing from you this week. And please continue to pray for the Olive Tree Ministries team for daily global updates with a biblical worldview 24 hours a day, log on to olivetreeviews.org. Next week, Jan returns with another program designed to help you understand the times. Word.